It isn't very often that I get to look at Bernie smiling at me. You have to know Bernie to get that joke. This is a tremendous honor, not only for myself, but for all of my colleagues at MIT and all throughout the world who have worked on this uh, great initiative that we call CDIO. I want to start tonight on a personal note and thank my father, who was a high school teacher in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who taught me to always put the welfare and the learning of the students first. I want to thank my wife, Karen, who's here, for her tolerance <laughs> and understanding. My colleagues at MIT, uh, at universities throughout the United States, in the aero departments, uh, and around the world who have worked so hard uh, collaboratively, uh, as Chuck mentioned, developing an open source model for uh, engineering education reform. And I want to thank Bernie personally, I wish he had been here, uh, and the National Academy not for giving me this award, but for creating this award and giving it annually. There's a, there's a very important reason for this. For those of you who do not toil daily in the trenches of educational innovation, you may not understand just how difficult and how upstream a process this is. It's like swimming upstream every day. Universities are extremely stable institutions, so designed uh, in the late Middle Ages in order to prevent the interference from the church. When I was the executive director of the Cambridge MIT Institute, I would sit in Cambridge, Massachusetts and help my colleagues in Cambridge, England understand how modern universities worked or how they might work better. And I would actually say often when I went to lunch, 5 p.m. in London, that I'd done my part that day for changing an 800-year-old institution. These are very old and stable places. And it's a hard struggle to move these places. It may be obvious to many outside universities that the primary function of universities is to educate students. The raison d'etre of universities is for education. But unfortunately, in today's era, that's not exactly the way it feels on the inside. The system by which faculty are hired, rewarded, tenured, and promoted for making largely individual contributions that are published in journals that are then rated by citation indexes and impact factors. And then the universities are rated by how many papers their faculty have produced with how many citations in how many journals of what impact factors has created enormous skew in the system. That uh, the, the, the behavior that it, this brings about is not exactly unbiased. That we have created this self-referential system, which is particularly, I believe, inappropriate for engineering, where part of the main objective of engineering research in universities is to impact what industry is actually able to do, which is not well reflected in the citation uh, and uh, impact factor scheme. I think we really need to do something about this. I think that in this nation we can lead the way internationally in creating a, first a national dialogue where we can rebalance the registers, that we can create incentives for universities and for individual faculty members and send the message to them that their primary job is, in fact, to go into classrooms and to work in laboratories and to help students learn. This is not an easy undertaking. I think we should empower university leaders to say simple things like, education is the primary mission of our university, and to not entwine education with, the, with the, the triple helix of research and impact on national economic and regional economic growth. There are tremendous researchers at universities, several of my colleagues who have been honored tonight. There are important contributions to national and regional economic growth. But we have to go to work as educators believing that our primary mission is to help the students learn. Uh, 
we have to engage industry in a new and meaningful way. Industry is the surrogate for the measure of our success. They know whether the students that come out of MIT or Caltech or the Ohio University are more or less successful in their engineering careers. We should welcome their input, their substantive input about how we're doing, and we should react to it. We, the American people, and the Congress should authorize, and appropriate, I guess you would say, Mr. Secretary, the, um, the agencies of the government, the NSF and the other missionary, uh, mission agencies, maybe they serve as missionaries as well, to help with the transitional knowledge of how engineering education research can be put into practice in the engineering classroom. We need engineering education research, but there's an awful lot that we know about how students could better learn that we don't put to work. We need to encourage young faculty members to learn how to teach. Does it seem anomalous to anyone else in the room that to teach 12th grade high school mathematics in America, you need a master's degree in education? And to teach 13th grade college freshmen, you don't have to have had one single day of formal preparation in education? This seems like an, 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 an awfully unexplainable dichotomy. We should expect young faculty members and older faculty members to read the literature in education, to go to workshops in it, to continue professional development in it, so that they keep up to date in education as they keep up to date in research. It's a professional endeavor. And lastly, we should expand the role of professional societies and bodies like the NAE who will continue to create the incentives and to create the energy and to create the organizations which will allow faculty members around the country to improve. I have a great deal of hope and optimism about this. In my opportunity to travel around the world and uh, in, engage in discussions about engineering education with many deans and university presidents and heads of national academies and ministers of science and technology, they all bemoan the same thing. Why are our students not studying engineering? Why are our faculty members not as dedicated as they might be in an ideal world to education? And usually, especially when I'm talking to Chuck's counterparts, the heads of various national academies, I look at them and I say, is there a major award in your nation to recognize engineering education contributions? I have not found one outside of the United States. I asked them, can someone be elected to your National Academy of Engineering in part for contributions to education? I have found very few outside of the United States. That this academy has a leading role in the world of establishing the principle that education of engineers is an important, valid process to be undertaken at universities. And we need to build on this to promote the future of the nation and our national welfare. And I think we can do it. We have a very strong basis in very large part brought about by the contributions, both morally and, and financially, of Bernie Gordon, who would like to, I would like to end tonight by thanking again. Thank you very much. <laughs>